well, in the interest of time, I am going to go ahead and kick us off here um, and let people continue to join. And my able co-hosts will allow people to come in from the waiting room as we get started. So, um, so good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the second webinar in our 2021 Summer Science Seminar Series, brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, or the Southeast CAS, or CCASC. Um, so my name is Carrie Furness, and I'm the program manager here at the Southeast CASC. And in these, this virtual seminar series, we're highlighting CCASC funded projects that support resource management positions across the Southeast. Yeah. Um, so here's what to expect real quickly from today's webinar. Um, we'll go over some quick meeting logistics, including getting some feedback by a short poll. Um, and then we'll go into our presentations. The format for which is going to be five lightning talks by some awesome students at our consortium universities, followed by um, a short question and answer period. So we're featuring today some projects that were undertaken by students at our consortium universities, um, which include Auburn University, Duke University, North Carolina State University, University of Florida, and University of Tennessee. So these projects were funded as a means to extend some um, CCASC work that was um, is being done by Lydia Olander and her team at the Nicholas Institute of Environmental Policy Solutions. And that work is mapping the supply of ecosystem services and the demand for those services at the landscape level across the southeastern United States. So these maps use data from publicly available national scale sources and the student projects were intended to extend the use of the data or methods generated at Duke um, or develop additional data maps or methods to support regional mapping um, of ecosystem services and co-benefits. So um, let's see here, before we get started, I'm gonna cover really quickly um, just some features of the Zoom interface, which you all I'm sure are fairly familiar with, but controls on the bottom left, unmute, mute, start your video. Please keep your video off and stay muted unless you're speaking during the Q&A. Um, and we'll try to do those reminders or um, override as needed. Um, in the bottom bar of your Zoom interface, you can ask questions and encourage you to go ahead and throw some questions in the chat as we go along um, as they come up. Um, and then um, we are recording this video um, and it will be available um, on our um, on the CCAS website after this um, seminar um, on our YouTube channel and on the um, event page. So um, we'll also be, let's see. Okay, so now I would like to launch a short poll. Um, hopefully you're seeing this. So this is, um, gives us an idea of who's with us today um and then also helps us know how to get information out about the seminars so if you oops, sorry i did not push launch so if you want to go ahead and um, answer these um two questions just to give us some of this feedback that'd be real helpful for us and i think it also helps our students know who's in the audience and and how um how they might emphasize um aspects of their work so yeah, thanks. Okay, so just another few seconds here. Looks like. Okay, thank you. So I will go ahead and end that poll. Um, share you the results real quickly. And glad to see that you all are read, both reading a newsletter and sharing amongst yourself. Um, and it's nice to see the breadth of folks in our audience today. So thank you again for joining us. Let me close that up. And so now, We'll start to move on to our presentations. But first, I want to introduce um, a couple of folks who have agreed to um, be on a respondent panel. And so they're going to prompt our discussions um, by providing some comments or questions to the students after their presentations. Um, and then, of course, others may also um, join in to pose some questions as well. So. Um, that panel is Janet Cushing, who is the Deputy Director of the National Climate Adaptation Science Center, where she helps oversee um, hey Janet, the CASC network and is also in the role of partnership and policy coordinator at the national level. Um, and when she can find time, she continues to work in the realm of ecosystem goods and services, carrying on work that she started when she was with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so Michelle Mormon, 
um, is an inventory and monitoring ecologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based at Lake Manamesquite National Wildlife Refuge. Ryan Boyles is a climatologist and serves as the deputy director for the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And finally, Rua Mordecai is a conservation planner located in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, and he's the coordinator for the Southeast Conservation Blueprint, which is a living spatial plan that identifies important places for conservation and restoration in the Southeast and Caribbean. So student Sarah Love will moderate the discussion for the first half of presentations and Melinda Martinez will play that role for the second half. So now I'll stop sharing and pass on the role of presenter to Shirley Tando from the University of Florida, who will give our first lightning talk today. Hey, Carrie, uh, sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. um, in the chat box, there's someone who wrote that they couldn't see, um, I guess, what's on the screen. Ah. Well, she was referring to the poll, which you then published. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 Yes. Okay. All right. So we're in good shape then. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. All right. So Shirley, go ahead. Um, hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, my name is Shirley. Um, as been introduced earlier, um, I'm from the University of Florida. Um, I recently graduated with my PhD in construction management. Um, so my presentation will be mostly um, based on the um, urban built environments coming from a construction um, background. So um, our, the topic is the impact of urban development on aquifer ecosystem services. <laughs> And um, I did this with my advisor who um, is not available here today because he has some issues with his mom um, who's not recovering. I mean, not too well, but then. Um, okay. So, um, the um, study area that um, we looked at, we initially decided to look at was the St. John's um, River Water Management District, which covers about 18 counties in um, Florida. Um, getting data from all these counties was way too much. And the only place we were able to get the data from, which was also a bit of a challenge, like going back and forth, was just Orange County. Um, for Alachua County, that's like the county I'm in, so it was easier for me to like obtain data. So I indicated those red um, portions to indicate the counties that um, the uh, um, this project was focused on. And for today, I will only present on Alachua County. So um, the aim of the project was um, aligned with the aim of the St. John's River Water Management District, which is to supply water needs to communities and at the same time, um, keep nature's needs. Um, that is maintaining ecosystem services without um, any interference. So um, um, we looked at the impact of urban development on the ecosystem um, in terms of if there's um, a development in a particular area, how does it affect the water balance and how does it um, essentially um, affect the ecosystem services that happen within that environment. So we looked at the pristine stage, that is the um, environment when nothing has been done to it in its natural state, and also when there's a change to the land cover as a result of development. So basically, we're looking at um, the components of the water balance that we looked at was um, evapotranspiration, runoff, and infiltration. But the main focus was on infiltration because um, the redrawal is coming from the aquifer so we want to make sure that we maintain the aquifer level and also the health of the aquifer. So the recharge is what mostly gets into the aquifer. So that's why the focus of this was 
um, on infiltration. So um, um, this project was to look at how the aquifers impacted and what can we do to bring, to keep the health of the aquifer or keep the levels of the aquifer. Um, this flow chart shows like essentially what happens in like the water cycle. So we have precipitation that comes off as rainfall, and then we um, it gets partitioned into evapotranspiration, infiltration, and runoff. And then because we are dealing with the urban environment, we look at water withdrawals. So for Florida, the main um, water supply is coming from the aquifer. That's the, um, the Floridan. And then when we redraw, it goes through treatment before it gets to like the communities. At the community level, we either use it in indoors or we use it outdoors for irrigation. Um, anything that goes indoors comes out as wastewater, goes through the wastewater treatment plant. And what happens after that is they either go to the wetlands to get recharged slowly or they go through um, um, the reclamation facilities and then gets re um, treated and then gets back to the community as reclaimed water, which is mostly used for um, irrigation. And then finally, um, majority of it in Gainesville goes to injection well, and then it recharges back into the aquifer. But this time, it doesn't stay like the wetland so that it slowly, like the natural processes takes place and then it goes. This is like an artificial process to enhance um, the level of the aquifer. So it's injected deep into the lower Florida. Um, at the wetland level, we see evapotranspiration happen and we also see infiltration that gets it back into the um, upper Florida. So um, essentially we are looking at at these levels, there's a change to the um, ecosystem. And then due to the urban development that has happened and what can be done so that we try to keep the, we try to keep the urban processes going. And at the same time, try to maintain the system in its natural state or get it closer to what it was before. So um, we ran some scenarios um, to look at um, areas where like we have more recharge. So on my left is um, the whole county, that's Alachua County, and then the areas of hotspots for recharge and at the undeveloped state. And then in the middle is at the developed state because we are looking at undeveloped and then developed as a result of urban development. And then we realized that there's more recharge at the undeveloped stage compared to the developed stage due to the built environment or things that has happened. So the question now is how can we get more recharge back into the um, aquifer even in the developed state? Um, we compare this one to also um, portable water that we are coming to so redrawal because it's redrawal and then what is going back. So at the right is um, was looking at redrawal hotspots in the county. And we also saw that it was, you couldn't really find much going on. And this can be attributed to a lot of factors considering that the county is big and then um, we only pay just one utility company. So there might be other, which is the main one or do, but then there were more parcels that were not in that same service um, area. So some of them might not um, be counted for in this. Um, also, one other thing that I looked at was runoff. Um, runoff, um, I looked at it as it can be, it can help the ecosystem services or it can damage the ecosystem services. So I looked at the uh, runoff hotspots also in the county um, at the undeveloped state and also at the developed state. Um, it was expected that at the undeveloped state will have less runoff than the developed state. But then the, the analysis that was done showed that there was rather more 
at the undeveloped stage, which was quite strange. Um, and again, I, I believe that it's due to a lot of factors and also the scale of the project, because um, earlier projects that was done on smaller scale showed that there was actually more um, runoff on um, developed stage than the undeveloped stages. Um, this also, the graphical analysis showed all the components of the urban water system. So that's evapotranspiration, runoff, and infiltration. And then we see that at the undeveloped state, we have them more than at the developed state. So we have more infiltration at the undeveloped state than um, developed state. And then we have more runoff rather on the developed state than on the undeveloped state. And then we looked at this in terms of portable water. So um, we see like how we get the portable water fluctuates as the years go by. And then what we get out of it in terms of um, infiltration, evapotranspiration, and then runoff. But then um, we are bearing in mind that the infiltration, runoff, and um, um, evapotranspiration is not coming from just portable water, but it's majority of it is coming from rainfall. So it's more um, influenced by rainfall compared to portable water because the amount of portable water we are getting in is less than the amount of rainfall that we get in. So the um, chart on the, um, on the right shows um, from 2010 to 2018, how much um, portable water we are getting over the years, and then how much is going back. So the blue one is the total infiltration that's considering rainfall. And then the gray one is just the infiltration that is coming from um, the redrawal. So we see that we are redrawing more from the aquifer, but then we are not getting back um, a lot um, to it. So the more we redraw, the more we interfere or we destroy the ecosystem services. And then if we are able to give, get back more into the um, aquifer, then we'll be able to maintain it. But then that is not the situation. So as development occurs, we realize that the ecosystem services are being manipulated or are being interfered with. Um, Early, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we need to, if you could wrap up as quickly as possible so we can. Okay, Thank so you. the last thing that we looked at was um, um, socioeconomic factors that affect, um, that somehow affect the ecosystem services. And what we looked at was the social vulnerability index. So we ran the social vulnerability vulnerability index for the whole county and then compared it to um, the redrawal that people make that does it have any um, impact on redrawal and then we realized that mostly um, areas with high social vulnerability had higher redrawal and areas with low social vulnerability had lower redrawal and the more the, the more we redraw like I mentioned earlier the more we interfere with the aquifer um, system and then the ecosystems that happen so um, some of the things that came up that can be done to maintain the ecosystem services were some sustainable practices such as the injection well. So the more we inject back, the more we are keeping the level and trying to maintain the ecosystem services. So that's one thing that was seen here that we know can um, help um, maintain the ecosystem services. Also, another thing that came up was um, like the use of um, um, the use of roofs, um, green roofs. So it's like when you take up the space and then you put the green roofs at the top of the buildings, you are sort of keeping the natural, so trying to keep the natural um, space that you have taken up with the green roof that um, you put on the buildings to sort of keep the ecosystem services running. Um, and those are some of the things that came up. Um, and as I mentioned, there were some of the things that did not really make sense, like on the developed and the undeveloped state. But then again, there's the other county that I'm working on, and then it will help me because Alachua County is more urban, more rural than urban. And then I believe Orange County is more urban than rural. So that will help um, see how things stand um, in terms of if there's, if there's more urban 
um, than rural and how um, it affects the ecosystem and how it can be done to like keep it in the its natural um, state. Um, thank you. Okay, unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time for questions because we do need to move on to the next presenter. Um, who is? Yeah, I'll introduce the next presenter as Sarah Lapuma from Duke University. So Sarah, if you want to get your um, presentation going, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So my name is Sarah Lapuma. I am a recent graduate from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, this is a story map I created based on my master's project at Duke, um, building social equity into floodplain buyouts. The bottom line of my project has been this. While strategic floodplain buyouts are important for long-term resilience, towns may be conducting them in a way that worsens social inequities. First, I'll start with flooding. Uh, in the US, flood costs have averaged $8.2 billion per year, and that cost is increasing year over year. Um, hurricanes are and floods are natural phenomena, but that has, um, but the risk comes when we build our houses and our infrastructure close to areas that are exposed to these flood hazards. Um, development is the current driver of uh, flood issues and flood costs associated with them. However, climate change will aggravate the issue because of the increase in intensity of rainfall, hurricanes, and flooding. Um, however, detrimental flood impacts can be lessened using various hazard mitigation tools. North Carolina is no stranger to major hurricanes. Um, Hurricane Florence occurred in September of 2018, and it really battered Newburn, North Carolina um, as a slow and relentless storm with heavy rainfall and storm surge. In Newburn, it caused over $100 million in property damage, over 300 businesses and 4,000 homes were damaged by Hurricane Florence. Uh, in some places, there was over 10 feet of storm surge, and uh, almost 800 people had to be rescued during and after the storm because of the intensity of the flooding. Um, below the text on the map is an interactive map of the uh, extent of flooding during Hurricane Florence. Uh, in blue is the flood area and yellow is the drier area at the time. Um, so it was really intense and all encompassing in New Bern along its rivers and creeks. Uh, buyouts are just one hazard mitigation measure in uh, local government's toolkit uh, to reduce uh, hazard and flood risk. Um, so a buyout is when a um, is when a property is replaced by a more natural landscape. So uh, buyouts reduce future flood impacts and losses on a property by replacing the damaged homes and infrastructure after a hurricane or major flood with uh, open space. So this open space could be a park or a wetland area that, that's been restored or a vacant lot at times. Um, and so that helps the buyout participant because they hopefully will move to a place with less flood risk using um, funds from the government uh, that the government gives them in exchange for allowing the home to be bought out. And it also helps the surrounding community and property owners because that increases the amount of land that is open and available for floodwaters to move into without damaging property. Uh, federal government agencies like FEMA and the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, support states and then those states support uh, local governments to conduct buyouts. So New Bern has created a list of potential buyout locations and is working for uh, with the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency to begin the buyout process. Um, however, uh, 
we have to focus on the people who may be potential buyout participants to really understand the, the situation that folks are going through after a flood event that can be disastrous for a family and community. Um, and we have to consider the unequal exposure to risk across the landscape uh, based on race and class, especially. Um, vulnerable communities, it's been shown in research, are um, more prone to damaging and long-term effects from flooding. This is specifically um, for communities of color and low-income communities who may have been marginalized and then pushed over time into areas that may be more flood prone because of segregation, gentrification, and exclusionary practices, including, including redlining and uh, mortgage, unfair mortgage practices. This research had led me to the concept of social vulnerability, um, which is the idea that um, characteristics of a community like being having a more low income people, being majority of people of color, and um, and other issues like the the type of housing that folks are able to live in, their language ability, and access to transportation influence their ex adaptive capacity and their ability to tolerate environmental hazards. Um, this doesn't fully explain all of the ways that makes a person more at risk or more resilient to uh, disastrous events, but disasters can magnify already pre-existing um, issues that a community or a family is going through and make life much more difficult for them so that they are, have a more difficult time uh, getting back on their feet from a major disaster. The map below shows the CDC Social Vulnerability Index uh, for New Bern, North Carolina, and that is interactive as well. Um, so to combine all of these issues, uh, when buyouts are focused in socially vulnerable communities, which research has shown they often are because those communities often have cheaper housing, which is easier and cheaper to buy in larger numbers, and that supplies more flood resilience for the rest of the community. Um, even though that may be true, uh, buyout program administrators uh, may be purposefully targeting uh, communities for retreat. Um, as Cider says, whether mal maliciously as an attempt to remove portions of the community, pragmatically targeting affordable housing in order to purchase the most homes with limited funding, or beneficially as an attempt to aid those at greatest risk. So even if this is beneficial uh, for communities, it has to be done with extreme care because uh, floodplain buyouts are not an easy process. There's a lot of monetary cost in relocating, loss of community identity and disruption of social relationships for those participants. So my master's project study uh, was a study of all of these concepts uh, put together. Um, and so I took the CCASC's ecosystem services data sets, uh, storm surge, sea level rise, and flood extent data sets for New Bern, North Carolina. And I put them together with the data set on social vulnerability and on all uh, added these together on the parcels of New Bern. And I made a prioritization process for where um, buyouts may be able to occur without increasing uh, social equity issues. Uh, you can access this study um, on, at the link here. And, um, and so this is a map of storm surge during Hurricane Florence and New Bern below. The conclusions of my study were that although um, although buyouts are an important way for uh, communities to increase their long-term resilience to flooding, um, if buyouts aren't conducted by prioritizing uh, social vulnerability, um, they may perpetuate displacement of low-income communities and communities of color, which would be an extreme equity issue that we would have to um, deal with and uh, mitigate for years to come. Um, and so my recommendations to the state of North Carolina in 
in um, reviewing all of my research where that North Carolina should uh, create a list of potential buyout properties using a prioritization process that includes both flood risk attributes and social vulnerability information. Uh, they should increase the state funding for floodplain buyouts so it is not just contingent on the federal grants for major disasters. And they should create a robust uh, a program to counsel buyout recipients for every step of the buyout process from uh, the disaster after the disaster occurs to the full relocation process so that the uh, entire buyout process is less um, detrimental to the families that are moving away from the home that they've always known. So I would like to thank CCASC, uh, the Nicholas School of the Environment, and my advisors for uh, helping me along in this process and helping me get access to the data so that I could really research this important topic. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Sarah, please um, unmute yourself or ask them in the chat now, especially our panel members um, can go first. It looks like we have one from Lydia Olander where she asked, were you able to get anyone at NCORR to engage on your prioritization work? I am. A t I uh, was able to contact somebody who's working on buyouts and uh, she said that she showed it to her colleagues in the office and I've also sent the study to the um, to the executive for NCORE. Um, and so I hope that we'll be able to discuss uh, this further. I'm sure it's a really busy time right now being hurricane season. We have one more from Michelle Mormon. What happens to renters and or public housing residents whose properties are bought out? Uh, renters and public housing residents go through a different process. The government has a different funding source uh, for people who own multi-family buildings and the uh, federal agencies are, I think through HUD, are able to fund renters to move to a new location. In fact, the image that I showed of the uh, family walking away from a flood situation, their public housing residents who uh, that public housing area in New Bern is currently being um, uh, discussions are underway to to uh, remove those buildings so that and then build a new public housing uh, area for those folks to move to. But that's under a totally different um, funding source. Thank you. It looks like we're out of time for questions for Sarah. Great job. Oops, sorry. I'm um, trying to get that unmute button going. Um, so yeah, so I want to introduce our next lightning speaker, who is Melinda Martinez from North Carolina State University. Hi, um, I'm Melinda, and I'll be talking about some of the ecosystem disservices of ghost forests. And so um, if you're not familiar with the term ghost forests, these are freshwater forests and wetlands that are rapidly transitioning into marshes along the coast. And so basically, as these marshes migrate for the inland into these freshwater forested ecosystems, I mean, there's a shift in ecosystem services and at times disservices. And what I mean by that is if a system becomes or oh, cha changes from a carbon sink to a carbon source during this transition period. And so wetlands in general uh, are known to provide several ecosystem services, <clears throat> including carbon sequestration, which is what I'll focus on for the majority of this talk, but they also provide other services that include nutrient cycling, storm surge buffers, um, and are nursery grounds for many species. And so in North Carolina, there are approximately 1.3 million hectares of coastal forested wetlands shown in green here. Uh, but this of course is an overestimation because this does include uh, managed pineland um, and then um, human impacted swamp forests, but also headwater swamp forests. Uh, and this is uh, data collected or uh, downloaded from North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. 
And so um, along the coast, there's also about 125,000 hectares of coastal marshes, which is shown in light brown here. And so uh, researchers at the Duke Nicholas Institute have worked on uh, doing this uh, mapping of co uh, carbon sequestration rates in North Carolina coasts. And so this is what you see here. This is data downloaded from their website, and it is freely available. And this ranges from, the carbon sequestration ranges from zero to 18 metric tons of carbon per year. And so in addition to the carbon sequestration rates, um, migration space for marshes was also estimated for the North Carolina coastline for various sea level rise scenarios. And this is beginning from a one and a half feet increase in sea level rise. And so what you see here in this light purple are forested are areas that are currently forested, uh, but are projected to transition to marshes in the future. And so these are uh, potential future ghost forests. And so as we increase to three feet uh, in, of sea level rise, you can see the land impacted um, or the forested areas impacted by this increase. And this is a four foot increase in sea level rise. And then a six and a half foot increase in sea level rise. And if you can see that uh, along the Albemarle Pimlico Peninsula, this is mostly the, the largest area affected, um, not only in North Carolina, but across the Atlantic. And so it is considered a hot spot uh, because it is so, so close to um, the land elevation, it's so close to mean sea level, sea level rise already. So not only is it pretty low in elevation, uh, but the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula has also had extensive canal uh, and ditches created in order to make the land more suitable for agriculture. And so what you see here are um, some of the canals um, that are in place. And so through these same canals, some of the brackish water from the Pamlico uh, sound, uh, or I guess this, both sounds, um, the Croton sounds, can travel further inland into these freshwater uh, forested areas. And so you see die back further inland in areas where you wouldn't expect so quickly. And so a study by Smart et al. Uh, used LIDAR um, in order to assess um, changes in biomass um, that occurred from 2001 to 2014. And so they were able to classify areas uh, or forested areas that are transitioning to forests or to marsh. And so these are essentially ghost forests, which are indicated in these red. And what you see here uh, is a drone um, landscape view of what a ghost forest looks like is where you have a bunch of standing dead trees um, where um, marsh shrub is encroaching. And so in a separate study as part of my dissertation, um, I was also focusing on detecting early warning signals of ghost forests using the Landsat archive. And so what you see here are um, areas at, that are uh, showing early warning signals of an oncoming transition or are currently in the process of transitioning to marshes. And so the number of standing dead trees or also referred to as snags uh, were estimated using USDA forest inventory analysis data, uh, but we also use values estimated by another study within the APP, uh, which is by Yuri et al. And so using the FIA data, um, this program collects information across the US uh, for the status and trends of forests. And so the points here indicate uh, plots in the latest survey. And then the data includes the spatial extent, uh, ownership, tree growth and mortality, harvesting, and then understory vegetation. And so what I did is we interpolated the, the uh, mortality, uh, so the snags that are present within those plots uh, to get an estimate for across the peninsula. Um, and so this ranged from zero to 35 snags per pixel. And so as far as the snag stem greenhouse gas emissions, we combined these fluxes that were acquired from one of my other dissertation chapters. Um, and so these, the fluxes are um, obtained by using this flexible tree chamber um, and this that you see in this image on the right and it is collected using a portable gas analyzer called the gas map. Uh, but this was combined with the number of snags, um, both using the FIA data, but also literature estimates in order to get an, uh, a collective estimate of greenhouse gases that are emitted by ghost forests. And so these are the ecosystem disservices that I, I was referring to in the title uh, across North Carolina, but also the, the peninsula specifically. And so uh, as far as the current ghost forest greenhouse gas emissions go for the peninsula, 
Um, I did this by looking at both, using both study spatial extends, the SMART et al, and then the Martinez et al. Um, and so uh, from the Duke uh, carbon sequestration rates, we know that um, for these, these transitioning areas, they currently sequester about 235,000 metric tons of carbon per year. Um, but the snags within those same areas using the FIA data for the number of snags uh, are emitting 168 metric tons of carbon. And so for the Martinez et al, which has a larger spatial extent, uh, which you previously saw, um, sequesters about 851,000 metric tons of carbon. Um, and then the snags um, emit about 380 uh, metric tons of carbon per year. But this could be, um, these greenhouse gas emissions could be a slight underestimation because as you previously saw, there are ghost forests uh, considered like here along the coast. Um, but what you see in the FIA data when it's interpolated, um, it's showing zero snags. And so um, this is just based on the FIA data. And so when I look at the North Carolina coastline and so looking at the future ghost forests for different sea level rise scenarios, uh, for a one and a half foot increase in sea level rise, um, this, the forested area affected is about 139,000 hectares. And so what this means is um, using, the, using the snag count of 20 snags per pixel for a 30 by 30 meter pixel, um, the greenhouse gas emissions from these ghost forests is about 15,000 metric tons of carbon per year. And for a six and a half foot increase, which covers a larger spatial extent, um, which is 387,000 uh, greenhouse gas emissions for this area would be about 42,000 uh, metric tons of carbon per year. And so basically as these forested ecosystems are transitioning to marshes, um, you do get a shift from carbon sink to carbon source and it might take a while, maybe even a few decades before the marsh stabilizes and can become a sink in the future again. And so if you would like to read about the, some of the papers I referred here, um, please click on these links. Um, and I, of course, would like to thank my funding sources. And if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you, Melinda. As she said, um, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat. Or if our panel members want to unmute and ask them verbally, you can do so now. We'll ask Mason to go ahead and start his screen sharing um, while um, we take any quick question for Melinda. Okay, I'll go ahead and feel free to add those into the chat as we know, and there'll be time at the end, we hope, for some questions for all participants. So introducing here, um, Mason Petrie from Auburn University. Take it away, Mason. Hi, I'm Mason Petrie. Uh, I'm an undergraduate research assistant at Auburn University. Um, and our study was on the ecosystem services of green spaces uh, locating highly suitable communities in Alabama. Uh, our research group included myself, Elijah Johnson, Lindsay Maudlin, Shonda Namitra, and Karen McNeil. So to start off, I just wanted to kind of define what a green, what an ecosystem service is. Um, they're basically just all of the benefits that we receive from the environment around us. Uh, according to the EPA, whenever these resources are well managed, a lot of these benefits that we receive can include clean air and water, fewer and less severe natural hazards, uh, stable climate, biodiversity conservation. Um, but whenever they're not well managed, we get a lot of negative effects like pollution and climate change. And if you look on this graphic, um, a lot of these drivers of this change uh, is up to policy decisions, climate, pollution, and land use. So this graph is of the annual um, average temperatures of the Southeast US. Um, and as you see, the average temperature uh, was generally decreasing or stable for almost 100 years. Uh, and this trend is largely attributed to the agricultural transition from row crops to the forestry and lumber industry that increased forest cover and green cover uh, decreased the temperature. But in the last 40 years, that trend has quickly reversed, likely due to uh, urbanization. 
You now, one of these big effects of urbanization on climate is the urban heat island effect. Uh, these urban and built up areas are generally a lot hotter and they hold more heat than the vegetated areas like forests. Urban construction materials like concrete absorb a lot of solar energy, uh, a lot more than vegetated spaces. Uh, the EPA actually lists several ways to reduce UHI, such as increasing the shade producing vegetation around your home and installing green roofs, like Shirley talked about earlier, uh, like planting a garden on your roof. So some of these benefits of green spaces uh, include environmental, economic, and health benefits. Uh, these ecosystem services uh, could include the increased absorption of CO2, uh, absorption of heat through vegetation, lower energy demand and costs uh, for cooling buildings. Uh, it could even increase physical activity in communities, lower stress and improve physical and mental health. Uh, a lot of these benefits can help slow climate change and also improve people's quality of life. And when implemented correctly, they can provide provisioning, regulating cultural and supporting ecosystem services that benefit their communities. Some of the benefits to health uh, can include, uh, well, extreme heat can cause uh, dehydration, uh, things like cardiovascular disease, heat stroke, uh, and other health issues. But green spaces can help mitigate these effects uh, by preventing them from happening in the first place by lowering the overall temperature of an area uh, and improving overall health across the board. Another important thing to consider when talking about green spaces is that Socioeconomically and systemically uh, disadvantaged communities often lack close, accessible, high quality public green spaces. Uh, and the addition of these green spaces in these specific geographic locations can provide ecosystem services to people that typically wouldn't have access to them, uh, not only improving their lives, but also in increasing social and environmental equity. So, for our study, our research objectives were to identify prospective areas with high suitability rankings for the installation of green spaces. Uh, our study was exploratory and we used three factors known to impact UHI. Uh, and we performed the suitability analysis on three counties in Alabama, Jefferson, Montgomery, and Lee counties, uh, for the cities of Birmingham, Montgomery, and Auburn. Uh, the three factors we used were population and building density, land cover type, and per capita income. So uh, a suitability model is a model that's used to identify the ideal locations for a specific purpose based on certain characteristics of the area. Our model was made using the ArcGIS Pro 2.7 suitability tool. So the first step that we used was to uh, find a suitable, uh, was to define our objective, which is to find suitable areas for urban green spaces. Then we outlined our criteria, uh, which is low per capita income, high population density, and urban land cover types. Then we had to derive our data. Uh, all that we had to do was calculate the population density using census population data and census tract uh, land area. And we transformed all of these criteria on a range of classes from one to five, one being the least suitable and five being the most suitable. Then we weighted and combined this data uh, we weighted them all equally since our study was exploratory and then our maps generated um, showed us highly suitable areas and the uh, less suitable areas. So now we have our suitable green space zones uh, for Jefferson County. Uh, try to go back to this. There we go, Jefferson County. Um, there are several areas around Birmingham in particular that are suitable for green spaces, particular areas east and south of Birmingham, and this little interactive map, you can zoom in and really see areas up here and down here um, that are very dark on the map and are very suitable for green spaces. In Montgomery, um, there's some areas southeast of Montgomery that are very highly suitable for green spaces. And if you zoom in, you can kind of see these areas again. Um, one in particular, the, I think this is the East Chase area in Montgomery and um, some spaces up here around Alabama State University. And then in Lee County, uh, there's an area just west of Auburn University that is highly suitable. 
and you can zoom in and look at that on the map too. So our conclusions and ideas for future work, um, these suitability models can, using population density, land cover and income can help to identify these ideal locations for green spaces and evaluating suitable regions and including socioeconomic factors in particular help to ensure that the people who need these green spaces the most have access to them and can get access to them. Uh, there are several areas within these counties that can make great potential sites for green spaces, particularly near these city centers. Um, these areas have a heightened need for ecosystem, the ecosystem services that green spaces provide, um, and that the areas that are most prone to these urban heat islands. Uh, they can provide Green spaces can provide ecosystem services uh, regardless of their location, but these particular areas stand to benefit the most from them. So in the future, the suitability model can be improved using higher resolution geographic levels, if possible. Um, more factors could be introduced. The weightings could be refined and changed, uh, and modeling could expand to include other counties throughout the southeastern US. Uh, further research could include demographic data and more socioeconomic factors to promote environmental equity by highlighting this correlation between all of these factors and urban heat islands in the southeastern US. So we have some resources here uh, for finding funding for green spaces. Uh, there's a variety of civic, environmental, and health organizations that could potentially provide funding for these projects. Um, the EPA has a huge list of federal grants available uh, for green infrastructure projects from a lot of government agencies. There are also uh, a lot of grants available from companies and organizations. I listed a few here. Um, there are a number of creative ways to get funding for these projects uh, from different traditional and non-traditional stakeholders. Uh, some of these stakeholders could include community members, local, state, or federal governments, private landowners, land developers, and vulnerable populations, such as people with medical concerns or people who work in the outdoors. These are data sources. And I'd like to thank the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center for putting all these projects together. Uh, none of this would have been possible without their commitment to understanding global climate issues through actionable science. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time for questions, but if you do put them in the chat and you'll get to them. Um, but uh, we have up next, Sarah Love, our last presenter. And as Sarah starts to share, I'd like to encourage you to put any questions in the chat and hopefully we'll have people can hold on at the end. We can have continued conversation or we can do follow up after the seminar as well. Hey, is it my turn? I just got kicked out. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's important. Can yeah, we're not seeing your screen. Can you start sharing? See how that works. You are frozen. This is unfortunate. Carrie, okay, maybe do you have her? Um, I do not have a backup copy. Did not get that backup copy for this eventuality. Sarah, are you back with us? You are frozen there. Can you share or pass on your yes. presentation um, real quickly? Can you so hear me? Roll it. Yes. Yes. OK. Of course. Oh, no. Well, while Sarah is reconnecting, maybe we could entertain some questions. Um, maybe first with the panelists, and I'll see if we can get a hold of Sarah's presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, to roll um, while she connects by a phone, perhaps. Um, so I'd open it to any of the panelists, I guess, to kick off discussion um, for any of the panel, for any of the pre presenters.
Mrs. Rua, I can I can start. Um, that's, this is a question about um, a theme that cut across multiple of the presentations, um, but I think this idea of balancing out the, you know, from a particularly from an equity standpoint, um, balancing out the goods and bads of additional focus on on um, kind of underserved communities uh, seem to come up a lot in this sort of like there are benefits of like, for example, in the floodplain uh, example, there are some nice benefits, but also there are some real costs of relocating communities. And I know there's been some studies on green space and gentrification as well, where there are some great benefits of green space, but there are also some challenges of green space um, and what that does to certain communities. Um, so I'm curious if y'all had any particular thoughts about how do you best balance the pros and cons from an equity perspective of some of these ecological services that are happening in, in these affected communities? I know it's a big question, but might as well start with something tricky. <laughs> um, Kari, I'm back and I think my Hi. internet's stable. I can ask the question again after, after you're done. We were just filling in while we were waiting for you to, to come back on with the question. Okay, of course, as soon as you go to present, um, the internet just goes out, right? That is just how this happens. Okay, can you guys hear me well? Yes, you're Great. good. Okay, so let's do this really quickly. I'm sorry if some of you have to leave, um, but my name is Sarah. With Paul Arms, with other faculty advisor where we examined associations between indices of social vulnerability and environmental quality in the southeastern United States. So this study arose from an observed deficit in our understanding of the relationship between sociodemographic factors and aggregate measures of environmental quality that consider air, water, and recreation as a single unit. So it's common to examine the impact of individual components of environmental quality on communities and the trends are relatively unanimous. Socially vulnerable populations experience poor environmental conditions across the globe. However, though aggregate indices of environmental quality are commonly used in decision-making processes, studies that examine the impact of these aggregate indices on socially vulnerable populations are less common than studies that examine the individual components. So to examine this, we had the following objective and question. Um, we, our objective was to explore the spatial relationship between environmental quality and social vulnerability within the southeastern United States, where we specifically asked, does social vulnerability correlate with environmental quality? And two, are there correlations between individual indicators of SBI and EQI within the southeast? So to examine this, we utilized two indices the EQI on the left and the SBI on the right. The EQI is described by the EPA as five domains that create a county-by-county -county snapshot of overall environmental quality across the U.S. And on the right, SBI is described by the CDC as the potential negative effects on communities caused by external stresses on human health. And the SBI variables we utilized were socio socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language, and housing type and transportation, like Mason referenced in his study earlier. And I just want to point out that for both of these indices, higher values indicate worse conditions. So higher EQI is worse environmental quality, and higher SDI is um, indicating more socially vulnerable populations. So for our ob ob objective, we utilized county level data for six states in the Southeast seen in gray. We focused on four component variables for SBI and three component variables with 11 sub indicators for EQI, which were selected by multiple literature reviews. And as you can see on the left in blue and green, sub themes for water and recreation were implemented to acknowledge differences in indicator types. So for water, we have quality and quantity. And I just want to point out that NIFU permit here stands for National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, which is just indicative of permits that allow stream pollution in a given area. 
And then for recreation, we have access and use. And access is composed of indicators of green space opportunities and needs. And use um, is composed of an indicator of the county level demand for recreation, bird watching, for example. So just to reorient orient you, darker color indicates higher values um, and low environmental quality, high vulnerability. So overall, we found a weak negative correlation between social vulnerability and an aggregate measure of environmental quality, EQI, indicating that more socially vulnerable communities may live in areas with better overall environmental quality. And this was surprising given the preponderance of evidence shown previously that vulnerable communities reside in poor environments. However, when SCI and environmental quality were separated into individual parts, we observed a more nuanced relationship between the two. So first, for air EQI, we found that the aggregate measure of air quality, which is composed of particulate matter, surface ozone, and others, um, this aggregate measure was not significantly correlated with SCI. And when broken into individual components, particulate matter was also not significantly correlated, but surface ozone was, and it was negatively correlated, which suggests that higher SDI communities have less surface ozone. Similarly, the aggregate measure of water was not significantly correlated with SDI, but all of the chosen sub-indices were negatively correlated suggesting that more socially vulnerable populations have higher water quality and quantity than low SDI counties. Last, in regards to recreation, we found that one indicator of access, open space demand at the top, and the indicator for use, bird watching demand at um, the, the center here, were negatively correlated with SDI, suggesting less recreation demand in socially vulnerable communities. However, the other indicator of access, green space deficit here on the left, was positively correlated with SBI, suggesting that more socially vulnerable counties have less green space overall. So in conclusion, in contrast to the preponderance of data showing poor environmental quality in socially vulnerable areas, our analyses did not fully support these findings. And when we examined correlations between individual components, we found even more nuanced trends in the data. Aggregate indices did not always re represent trends seen between the sub-indices. So the negative correlation between the SCI and EQI can likely be attributed, attributed to the fact that there are many more socially vulnerable rural counties with higher environmental quality and less socially vulnerable urban counties that have lower environmental quality. For example, there are well-known income gradients between rural and urban areas, and income is a component of the SBI. So some applications. One, our results highlight how incorporating SBI into environmental models could allow practitioners to better understand the nuanced social environment of targeted communities. Two, these data demonstrate how the heterogeneous distribution of environmental quality in areas with a stark urban-rural divide could complicate environmental ju justice. For example, our results showed that across the Southeast, more socially vulnerable populations correlated with more rural counties with better environmental quality. However, if we consider individual components of each index, we see more nuanced results, like we said before. For example, when we looked at just the aggregate SDI, we found that more socially vulnerable areas had fewer NISTES permits, so less potential for water pollution, and no significant trends with aggregate water EQI overall. But when we look at the minority status component of SDI, we find that minority populations have significantly more NIPTES permits, so more potential for water pollution, and significantly poorer water quality overall. Thus, when appropriately used, these data could have important applications for community action and environmental justice. Some future directions um, are as follows. We want to test these hypotheses at a finer grain than county level. Um, expand our indicators, specifically adding values for ecosystem services, 
explore the rural urban trends within the analyses, and finally develop a multivariate model-based approach to explore the observed correlations. I just want to thank um, the CCAS, UTK EEB for providing this course, and USGS um, for supporting this work. Um, Paul Armsworth for his support as our faculty advisor, Carrie Furness, Katie Warnell, and Lydia Olander for their support, and participating graduate students at Auburn, Florida, Duke, and MCSU for the collaboration. Here are our references represented in um, this presentation, and I will take any questions now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I just want an opportunity to say thank you to all of the presenters um, just as we as we bring this to a conclusion, but we'll open the floor. Um, and thank you to you who have managed to um, hold on um, during this um, um, during these presentations and, and now this discussion. So if um, I will invite, especially anybody from our um, respondent panel who wants to um, offer some questions or comments. Um, and it looked like Rua, I think, put his, yeah. So I think that this question relates to Sarah's and uh, presentation as well as some others. So what are your thoughts on how to improve ecosystem services benefits for vulnerable communities? while reducing negative impacts like gentrification and relocation that often come from green space approaches. So Sarah or any of the other presenters or students feel free to go ahead and. Um, I just want to say this is Sarah LaPuma that I have been looking a lot into the concept of the practice of um, community land trusts in terms of reducing uh, the possibility of gentrification um, and worsening impacts for uh, low-income communities, uh, a community land trust can uh, mitigate the, the issues by preserving both the, the landscape that is being bought out, for example, um, to basically the government is creating that situation where they're preserving it as natural space, but also for um, future uh, looking forward, where are people going to move after a, um, after a buyout, uh, a community could buy a uh, plot of land in a drier area in a higher ground and save that as a community land trust and allow people to move to the higher ground location uh, and in more affordable housing uh, so that they have somewhere to go. And as opposed to uh, the higher ground being bought up by uh, real estate uh, folks like is what is happening in Florida uh, where, where real estate is moving toward the higher ground because it's becoming more valuable because of uh, the risks from flooding. Janet, did you have a comment or a question that you wanted to pose? Sure, I, I also typed it into the chat. Um, so first off, thank you to all of the speakers. Um, definitely listening to these science talks is the highlight of my day today. Um, but my question for you um, is that for, for each of your projects, um, what stakeholders did you engage? You know, and by stakeholders in this instance, I do mean specifically the agencies or entities who might use the results of your study. Um, and what did you learn from those engagements? And if if you didn't engage with any stakeholders, then um, I would strongly encourage you to do so as you proceed in your efforts. So any student want to jump in on that? Yeah, so I, I did not uh, engage with a stakeholder and agency, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but I do think um, the results from this, this study or why I basically uh, extended my, the results from my own dissertation uh, throughout the North Carolina coastline 
is definitely beneficial. And um, I mean, I think in the future, like as far as publications, I would like to continue uh, and maybe even talk to um, people at uh, the Wildlife Federation um, US who, who own a lot, large portion of these lands, um, especially on the peninsula. I mean, as far as my own dissertation, I did uh, communicate with them that I was working with them as far as like permitting stuff. Um, but that's as far as, as I went. Um, I did with the utility company, um, also the water management district. And um, I think there was also, um, I think the IFAS department in University of Florida. Hey, Shirley, um, would you mind elaborating? So what did you learn um, from interacting with the water management district? Um, I would say um, they weren't much help. Um, the data I used um, for Alachua County wasn't from them. It was mostly from the utility and then the um, poverty appraisal and then um, the Florida um, Geographic Data Library. But um, for the Orange County, I got, I got most of the data from um, a UF professor in IFAS. Um, I don't know, it could be because of COVID, but then getting the data was really, really, really hectic. I didn't get it so I wouldn't even say early this year. So it made the time, like the timing was really tight for me because most of the time it was like, since we started this, you were just sitting there trying to get data and then you weren't getting it. And maybe it's because of COVID, but then they tried as much as possible to, if I had any questions about the data that I got, they were, um, he was quite um, forthcoming with answers and then try to make time when he's available. But I think he was, he had other things going on. So it was quite tight for him as well. I'll say for, uh, for uh, Mason's project that we worked on together, um, a lot of these suitable communities are actually owned or I guess run by the housing and urban developments, you know, agencies for the cities. So for us to kind of move forward on our project, we have to communicate with them about um, what they'd be willing to do and, and, you know, what grants are available through them to, um, I guess, see these green spaces come to fruition. So I guess in the future, this is something that we are particularly interested in um, looking at further. Yeah, Sarah, love, or is there any um, impetus or, you know, follow on activity related to other stakeholders that you and your project uh, have plans about or, or anyone else on any of the other, Nate, I see you on the line, anyone else from that project, from the UT project? Yeah, I guess we've had some sort of discussions throughout. Um, we thought about, you know, bigger agencies like CDC or EPA that are developing these indices and trying to get them to work towards, you know, something in the middle that we were looking at. Um, but I mean, there's a number of regional, re, regional agencies as well. Um, we highlighted some in our report um, that we that we'll be publishing out. And so, you know, there, there are plenty of opportunities for people who are doing, whether it's environmental justice work, environmental quality work, um, social vulnerability work to sort of collaborate a little bit more around this space between looking at the connections between vulnerability, environmental quality, and ecosystem services. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's um, that's actually a good opportunity. Thank you, Nate, um, to just mention as we close, and I think we probably need to go ahead and bring this to a close, um, that there are products, um, both story maps as well as reports that have come from these projects. And we will be posting those um, in um, on our Southeast um, Climate Adaptation Science Center website. So we'll um, 
be communicating with those of you who registered for this <clears throat> directly about where those are going to be posted and hope that you'll um, look at those um, and uh, again continue to reach out to um, some of the presenters and authors of these really nice projects um, and um, consider some follow-on um, after this. So um, with that, I'm afraid we'll have to bring it to a close. And I, I know that there are some questions in the chat that we'll also pose and try to do some follow-up with, um, with um, some of the presenters and then feedback to some of those of you who have asked questions, especially our panel. So thanks again <clears throat> to the students. Thanks to our um, respondent panel. And thanks to all of you for, um, for participating today. <clears throat>